In this passage, short passage, which I will read, uh, the battle is over. Some of the musicians from the regimental band who are stretcher bearers, they're, they're, they're coming forward to, to try to find their dead. And they come up on the, they come up on the, on the cotton gin, the, the ditch in front of the cotton gin, the, the works. The, one of the characters is, is a, a musician, uh, but he's a, he's a music teacher at the Cumberland Academy back home. But when he, whenever he gets in a bad situation that he can't face, he all of a sudden becomes his he becomes the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> now there's a reason for that. But you have to read your book to figure it out. But Immediately, as he becomes, see the regimental band went in behind a lot of the a lot of the regiments right up into the uh, battle, which is quite unusual in civil war. The regimental bands following the infantry into the fight. But here they're trying to find the dead, and the musicians together again moved in the dim circle of the lantern. Their intermittent shadows were flung across the faces of dead men. They stumbled and tripped over the soft yielding bodies under their feet. They tried not to step on faces, but sometimes they did. Finally, they came to the ditch along the enemy's works at the cotton gin, and here they stopped. Others were there before them, and others were coming up from behind. With torches and lanterns they came, some of them talking quietly, some laughing even. But at the ditch, they all stopped, and the talking and the laughter stopped, and they stood quietly and wished they had not come at all. They were young men, most of them, but veterans of a long, vicious war. They were strong, dangerous men. Those boys in Nashville were treated all the way back to Mississippi. And when they got back there, starving to death, freezing cold, dysentery, they were still dangerous, individually dangerous. They were still ready to fight. It's just uncountable. They were young men, most of them, but veterans of a long, vicious war. They were strong, dangerous men, cynical about death, even their own, which they had long ago accepted as inevitable. They had seen other battlefields, other helpless dead, and thought that nothing could ever surpass or grieve or frighten them again. Even so, they found nothing in all their bitter days to prepare them for the scene that confronted them now. <clears throat> they stood in silence, listening to their own heartbeats, understanding all at once that whatever their experience, they had not exhausted the possibilities for horror. The empty breastwork stretching left and right before the shadowy bulk of the gin house were tangled of earth, torn earth, displaced headlogs, sharpened stakes. They were strewn with equipment, with broken muskets, gun rammers, hand spikes, jackets, overcoats, hats, caps, Bits of anonymous cloth and paper, tin cups, sardine tins. The ground was white with cotton lint and cartridge paper, save at the embrasures where the guns had been, and there the earth was scorched and blackened by the muzzle blasts. It was pitch dark behind the breastworks, a frightening dark, as if some unknown and unimaginable enemy lurked there, and the silent gin house loomed against the stars. But there was no enemy. <clears throat> the works belonged only to the dead. And neither the dead nor the victorious living had any use for them now. In the starlight and in the torchlight, as far as he carried, the dead possessed the violated earth. They were draped all over the parapet, festooned in the Osage orange, blown back from the embouchures. In the ditch before the works, they lay in geologic strata of regiments and brigades, piled six and eight and ten deep, an inextricable mass of gray and brown, a tangle of accoutrements and muskets, a blur of faces and claw-like hands. Some were almost naked, torn to shreds by canister and rifle fire, the clothes ripped from their bodies. Others lay whole and peaceful, dreaming among their comrades. Here and there, dead men who'd had no room to fall stood upright in the pile, still holding their rifles, their faces still set toward the memory of a vanished foe. Some of the dead were busy. They twitched and jerked from the violence of their passing. They heaved stubbornly as still living men tried to push up from underneath. 
the whole pile crawled with movement. There were too many, too many to believe. Jesus Christ, whispered the cornetist. Yes, thought the archbishop. Jesus Christ. The archbishop knelt by the clotted ditch. He knelt as low as he could until his forehead pressed against the earth. He thought he should pray, but the words would not come. And then it occurred to him that perhaps he was not supposed to pray. Yes, he thought. Sometimes I am just supposed to listen. So the archbishop listened and overheard, and overhead the sky was full of stars that spread in a vast luminous cloud from horizon to horizon. Meanwhile, the earth turned on its ancient axis, half light and half dark, always morning and evening somewhere. The morning spread across the world's face. It was out there now, making its way toward them, while the night fell westward with the stars. They too were moving, these mortals. They moved in a dream of their own making, whether toward the night or morning, the archbishop could not say. He only knew that he was moving with them. He listened, and in a little while, the words came that he needed, and he sent them up toward the infinite dark that lay between the stars. O oh God, the Father of all memories, forgive us this victory if you can. Wow. <laughs> that is it.